The jungle can be a wild and unforgiving environment. Mother Nature is only seen as cruel by human beings. But for the creatures who live in the jungle, it is just life, death, and procreation. My experience with Heidi May is death. She shut up. Torment, torture, and death. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in. This is our third podcast together. Uh, me, Henry, and the other one, Heidi May. Thank you so much for listening to these things that we're doing. Heidi's been very inspired, and she said, we need to make another podcast. I don't know where this one is going to go. Heidi has some notes in her classic Heidi scrawl. We'll see how we go. Well, I want to talk about your childhood, but you didn't seem to be into that. I'll do it. No, it's all right. We'll save it for another time. We'll save it for another time. So this this is a marathon, not a wind sprint. Well, I just figure we should try and do as many podcasts as we can while you're home. Right. Because you never know when I might get a job. Oh, shut up. (laughs) Okay. So I'm thinking today we'll talk about the Rollins Band. Really? Yeah, why not? Everyone always talks about Black Flag. You were in another band, by the way. I've heard that. Yeah. So here's my question to you. Why are you doing that face? Well, you no, look mental. I, well, I'm just getting ready for whatever. You look whatever. mental. Um, and we have a meeting today and you're not wearing that shirt. Heidi, you know something? I figured out something today. Yeah. We're leaving the car. There's a revelation I had mm. where you're all like, hey, we're going to go eat. Woo! You're all happy all the time. I can't stand it. And the happier and more buoyant you become, I notice I start aching. I feel like, uh, like I'm dying. I just feel I move slower, and I, that's when I figured it out. You have some kind of Bluetooth set up where you drain my energy. No, you drain yourself. No. Yeah, yeah you do. So I charge you. So basically what I'm saying to you is stop using me. Oh, come on. And how do I use you? <laughs> Let's talk about how you use me. Oh, I do. Wait, I oh, absolutely my God. do. I know. Exactly. Should I tell them how? Sure, go okay. ahead. Heidi is good-natured to a fault. Heidi is so honest. If you are someone who is bereft of most moral standards like I am, you can really have a great time. You can do bad things and know that Heidi will always do something good. And it's just fantastic. I can say something that I know will be upsetting. And every time I say it, it will truly upset her. (laughs) And I know that I can be really awful, but her integrity is so impervious to you know, humanity and our, our faults that she will always land on both feet and I can use that against her. Well, and I, and I do and that. I can't help it. I don't it's know about all that, but you did tell me one time that you said I use your goodness and honesty against you. Yes. Well, well, who, who says something like that? Someone who's really diabolical and has evil schemes. <laughs> I mean, it's like so me. uncool. <laughs> like you should, you should yeah, treat I mean, me like gold I mean, you should, instead of abusing me I mean, all the time. You should look to me for what did you just say? Death and destruction. I said you abuse me all the time. Yeah. You do. You take advantage of me constantly, and you know it. Right. And then you go on stage. This is the sad part. You go on stage and you talk horrible about me. I don't. And you imitate me with that crazy voice. Becca McDyer! Yeah, that thing. And yeah. then I get hate mail. How is that fair? <laughs> I think it's kind of funny. Yeah, to you. <laughs> it's hilarious. Oh, my God. Uh, uh, uh. Uh. Yeah, so I, I do take it. Today we, of it. we got back from lunch, and let me just tell you, Henry was done. I wasn't even anywhere near done, and he's like, "Time to go." So I had to pack my lunch <laughs> in containers and bring it back to the office. The lady gave her a a paper cup. Put your soup in that chick. Yeah, I didn't get to finish my <laughs> soup. I didn't get to finish anything because Henry was ready to go. Jeez, it's all about you. <laughs> and you know it's true. Who was talking the whole time? You, you were. Oh, my <laughs> God, Henry. You were. Then how did I get all my food down my fat face? Because you don't chew. You just swallow. <laughs> That's why. 
Oh my god, it's exhausting. Or Do you want me to tell him how you swer- why you swerved in the other lane and the guy honked and you almost killed me? You want <laughs> no, me to tell him why? No. Exactly. <laughs> And I won't say it because you don't want me to. <laughs> if it was the other way around, you would tell the story. But you would never do anything like that. Ugh. One day, you know what? I'm going to write a book called The Truth About Henry Rawlings. <laughs> and it's going to have all the truth in there. Politically correct my ass. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, now Listen. I want to ask you a few things about the Rollins band that I don't know. Now, when I first started working with you, yeah. Well, let me just tell you the first. Oh, day, we already yeah, went, go ahead. No, well, we already went over the first day and how rude you were to me. We had to set that straight. I've been paying for it ever since. Okay, but when I first started working with you, uh, you came into the office and you you looked like a tick. You did. Your head was really small. And you had a giant body from all that weightlifting. Uh-huh. It was insane. It was insane. Remember that weight you used to put around your neck and then you would lift and your neck got real big? You know that they had a strap and then yeah. you weight. Who does that? Who does that? I guess people want to look at And then I used to say, you better not lift that much because you're really going to hurt yourself. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And then one day you said, what's this? And you pulled up your shirt. <laughs> And I go, that's called a hernia. Because your belly button kept flopping out, remember? Yeah. yeah. No, Heidi. I, oh, really? <laughs> and you're like, no, it's not. I go, yeah, it is. That's, that's a hernia from lifting heavy, heavy weight. So then we had to take Henry Rawlings, and we had to get him a little surgery. And, you know, I've picked you up from, the, I've picked you up from surgery a couple times now. One, two, three, I don't know, three or four times. Yeah. And my favorite thing to do is to, when I'm picking you up, when you're still in your hospital bed and gown, before I get in there, I put my hand in there and I take a picture of him. Yeah. There's one photo of you. <laughs> I have one photo of you yeah. in the hospital bed and you look exactly like John McCain in the Hanoi Hilton. <laughs> exactly. You know that picture of him? Yes. You look, seriously, you could be his son. Mm. Look it up, folks. He has a better jawline than I do. Okay. Yeah, and then you just move on. <laughs> well, um... Okay, so when I first started working with you, the Rawlings band yeah. <laughs> that was, uh, yeah. was just ending, or had just ended, or was it ending? It was ending, one phase of it, yeah. I think it was ended. Well, the 1997 or thereabouts, you, when you came I in, met you after you took your safari to... Yeah, it was right when that lineup said, did its last shows in Japan. And before I got together with the Mother Superior guys. Yes. But let's talk about the original Rawlings band. Okay. All right. First of all, how did you, after Black Flag broke up, did you know instantly I have to find another band? Oh, yeah. It was implicit to hit the ground running. And it was one of those very scary wake-up calls. Because in Black Flag... It's some other guy's band. I mean, out of a 10-song record, you're getting handed about six or seven lyric sheets. So it's someone else's trip. And all of a sudden, I want to do my own band. And now I'm the boss. That's in quotations. But I'm paying salaries. And I'm dealing with logistics. Now i got to get a band into a van, down the road to a venue, another one, another one, another one, and keep the whole thing from falling apart. So in order to do that, I figured I better get going on that immediately. And soon as the band broke up, I started writing songs that became the Hot Animal Machine record. And that was 86. In very early 87, I was in New Jersey and I met with Andrew and Sim, who had been playing with Greg Ginn in his instrumental band, Gone. I said, what is your guy's status in that are you guys still a living, breathing unit? And they said, no. I said, so you've broken up. And they said, oh, yeah, we are so broken up. Those, you know. What made you meet with those guys? Because that's the rhythm section I wanted. Because I had toured with them in 86, and they were unbelievable. So they opened up for Black Flag? Uh Uh-huh. And that's how Greg met them. Well, Greg Greg met them. Good question how he met them. I don't know how he met them. But they were the opening band. So I saw them play for like a year. The two of them with Greg. And there's like one of the most formidable rhythm sections I'd ever seen. Wait, so, I, so Greg was in that band and then he would play in Black Flag too? Uh-huh. Yeah, ah. Greg would play all night. He'd play mm-hmm. the first set and the, he was uh, very intense. 
and Gone was really good. Especially that you know Greg was always always good, but that rhythm section was awesome. And they've been playing together for years, Andrew and Sim. So they just had this language. I mean, it was everyone would watch and kind of marvel at them. Anyway, uh, I wanted to grab them and say, "Hey, you want to be in a band with me?" Because there's your rhythm section taken care of. But I'm not going to poach them. And if they're in another band, I'm not going to try and steal. So I said, "Are you guys?" done and they said oh we are so done like we they left with a bit of resentment a lot actually well wait a minute this must have irritated greg it was made him furious and, <laughs> right but 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 i i was trying to be the good guy i said have we broken up and they said oh yeah i said no no really are we sure and they said w w we never want to go on the road with that guy again i said okay i got a concept to lay on you guys are you interested? Uh, this guy you've never met. He's my buddy from DC, Chris Haskett. I just did a record with him. Here's the cassette of it. Are you interested in getting together here in Trenton, New Jersey, where you guys live? We will come to you, find a garage or a practice space, and let's coagulate and uh, get together and see if anything sticks. How long was this after Black Flag? Uh, Black Flag broke up in July, August. I recorded the record, the solo record in October into November. And I was on tour on the East Coast in January, February. I was in Trenton doing a show. And... What was that lineup? Well, no, I was on my own. Oh, spoken word. Yeah, I was on my own. Oh. I had no band. And so I contacted them. I said, can we meet? And I met with them somewhere. And I said, here's what I want to propose are you interested they said yeah we're interested and we're also not obligated to anybody which was important to me and even then greg was going to the press saying he stole my band and they hadn't seen greg for months and so chris came up from washington dc i came from wherever i was living at the time and we all went to trenton new jersey to sim's mother's garage in trenton and Andrew and Sim, they can hear a song once and just start playing it. They're like that. So we were, by the first afternoon, we were playing pretty much everything on that solo record, that Hot Animal Machine thing, like effortlessly. They just were like, like this? And they're just playing it. You're like, yeah, that'll do. But this rhythm section had far more wallop. I mean, they were amazing immediately. And I think in the first three days of practice, we realized this, we're onto something. This sounds good. Very, very quickly, it came together. And then suddenly we're writing songs. Like by the end of the week, we've written like two or three songs that ended up on the Lifetime record. Like it's, it's working. And so we said, well, let's, this is it. And so Chris and I kind of moved in to Sim's mother's basement. That was, was like, nice of her. Oh, she's the best, Audrey. And we said, Audrey, here's a thing that's happening. And she's like, sure. And so we practiced like crazy had no management or no real direction and booked some shows via a guy named Randy who booked shows at the Trenton city gardens. Our first show was May 16, something like that. 1987 opening for the circle jerks at Trenton city gardens. And we went out there and did our thing and people seemed to like it. Uh, and we started a little tour that went all over America all the way to California, and we were drawing between, well, New York was good. New York was like a whole of 150 people, but mainly we were drawing about 10 to 30 people a night. It was uh, very lean. You had to start over. We had to start over. Very humbling. I didn't, I didn't know what to expect, but we get out to California. Everyone takes a breather and goes home for a minute to catch their breath, and then we leave again for Europe. And we were in Europe for like about three months, and we... How'd you guys book shows in Europe? Um, a guy I knew from Holland, who's a fan of mine, said, hey, I have a band. I can book a tour. I went, okay. And it's one of those tours you're like, what's this going to be like in the few days? And you're like, oh, no, this is going to be a little rickety. But we actually pulled it off. And this guy actually booked a fairly solid tour. His band opened. Their sound man became our sound man, Theo Van, mm -hmm. Van, Van Rock. His name is Theo Van Inbergen, I think, which means mountain. And one night we were just, we were, we're going to rename you. And at first we we're going to call him Teo Van Get Down. <laughs> I think Andrew came, Andrew is very smart. He came up with that. And then I think he came up with Teo Van Rock. And we all went, oh, oh, that's it. And from then on, he's been Teo Van Rock because he is, 
he is the low end ranger. And we came to the end of that tour and we were in England. We finished at the University Student Union near Halloween in London, jammed up to Leeds, England, where Chris still kind of had a, a room in, a, in a, an apartment, in a house. And we recorded Lifetime at the same studio where almost a year to the day before we had gone in to do Hot Animal Machine. I had no producer and I can't let the band produce it because that's just going to lead to fights and, and arguing. More bass, no, more guitar. I need a referee to come in and go, I'm mixing. So I called Ian Mackay from a payphone. And I said, Ian, I am down to like pocket change, a plane ticket home, and I need help. He said, I'll be out there. I'm, I'll, I'll leave tomorrow. So he came to California? No, no, no. He flew to Leeds, England. Oh, England. In one phone call. Oh, I we love finished him. in London. He's we finished such a good this long guy. tour. And he said, I got this. I said, I oh. have no money to pay you. He said, I'll see you tomorrow or the day after. And in like 40 some hours, Ian like staggers into the studio like on no sleep. He goes, Okay. Uh, he looks at the budget. He goes, okay, we've got about five days and we're going to walk out here with a fully mixed record. Are you guys ready to do your first song? Did you fund the album yourself? Yeah, with what meager proceeds I made from the tour. And it's like, you know, we came away from like 10 weeks of touring with about three or $4,000. The record cost about $2,500 to make or Why'd less. Why'd you decide to record in England? Because the studio was like 20 minutes from Chris's place. We knew the engineer. Mm. They didn't have much business. And they gave us a discount and they were available. And we had the songs we were ready right now. We couldn't afford to let fly to New Jersey or New York. Thankfully, there was a recording studio down the street. We called them and said, hey, you have any time open? They said, oh, do we ever? And so we called up Jeff, the engineer, and said, Jeff, are you available? He said, am I? They all needed work. So we lucked out. And Ian comes in and he goes, okay, play a song. We play it. And everyone's complaining. I didn't do that right. He said, nope, sounded fine. Moving on. I'm with Ian. Of course, everything's one take. It's just rock and roll. If you make 80 mistakes, hey, man, no. The Rolling Stones made mistakes on their albums, which they probably didn't. Anyway, we do the record per Ian's instruction. And all of us grumbled a little, like, because you're in a band full of perfectionists. And one of the, like, hey, you know, I kind of flubbed a note. Nope, that's all the notes you get. And we're moving on, because he saw the clock. And we recorded and did all the vocals with, you know, like, one take, one take, one take, done and mix 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 and we're out of there with i don't know like 11 or 12 songs in about five days and that was it is lifetime what got you guys a record deal well no i had a teensy tiny record deal with a little record store in santa monica that put out the hot animal machine record and the the henrietta collins ep and i said hey i got a band we're gonna make a record they said well we'll put that out too and they did and then they actually put up the next one called Hard Volume. And then I, we started having disagreements and we eventually parted ways with Texas Hotel Records. But it was those records that allowed us to go on tour because Texas Hotel did a deal or at that point my manager or lawyer, which I, I finally got, made a deal with Europe. So the records were now being printed in England and Germany. And so we could tour with a record kind of sort of in the stores. And so that's when the band, we got to be a very good, stable live band within a few shows because you have a rhythm section that just came off the road after a year of touring. So they're like ready. Chris adapted very well to being a one or two set a night guy because he had never done that before, but he fell into it very quickly. And we just became pretty good, pretty quick pretty fast and we were writing songs on the road so by the time we got to the studio the songs were all broken in there wasn't a hey how do we do this it was like watch us do this in one or two takes which saved us an incredible amount of time and money and the band basically went from strength to strength where it, by the second album we got to play australia and new zealand which was huge and we did very well there and then we always did very well in europe so we just we just became one of those bands that stayed in europe a lot and you'll see that a lot with a lot of like indie or punk rock bands, like you're big in Germany and you can't get arrested anywhere else. So we at, at one point had a German agent for Europe, but he prioritized Germany. And Germany is very much like America in that it's big, big country relative to other countries uh, in continental Europe. And every town is a venue or three. And if you want, you can tour Germany very well for a month at a time 
and never not get a crowd. A lot of college towns and a lot of places where they have a stage and they're serving beer and people show up. And we were treated very well. We started doing very well in, in England and Scotland, everywhere we went actually. And then more shows started coming in. Finally, we can now do, uh, we're in Singapore, we're in Japan, which is very thrilling for us. And we, South America became available eventually, like Brazil and Argentina, which was a thrill for us to go to these places, Russia, you know, places where if you're broke, you're never going to see on your own. But in a band, you know, you can kind of get in there. And so the band, it was very hard going because we were very ambitious and everyone in the band was a songwriter. I used to write songs. I would hum songs too. If, if anybody listening is familiar with the song on the... Uh, End of Silence record, which was the album that kind of broke things fairly open for us. That was right after Lollapalooza. But that album kind of came on the end of that. There's a song on there called Obscene. And that was my going to the grocery store riff. Whenever I'd walk to the grocery store in Silver Lake, I would uh, hum that to myself. And I say to the guys, I got a riff. And I hummed them that song. And they said, sure. We started playing it. I also had the riff for uh, the song You Didn't Need. And I hummed that to Chris at his apartment. He lived down the street from me in California. I said, here's a riff. And we made a demo of that in his bedroom. And we brought it to the other guys in New Jersey. And we turned that into a song. So you have four very ambitious people. And we just toured and recorded like, like crazy. Did you like it being your band in, as opposed to being in someone else's band? Like, did you prefer that? I preferred not being so crazy. Like in Black Flag, we get an offer to play Australia. And I'm like, wow, hey, let's play in Australia. And the higher ups would say, no, we have to become big in America first. Like, well, America will be here in three weeks when we come back. Then we get an offer to go, hey, come to Japan for three weeks of shows. I'm like, well, yeah, no, we have to become bigger in America. I'm like, no, the continent, North America will be here when we get back from Tokyo and Osaka and, and all these places. And that's fresh. I said to my my bandmates, when we sat down, I said, okay, guys, here's what I want to do. Uh, you know, Andrew and Sim, you just came off a Black Flag tour. Uh, Chris, you know, this is kind of new to you. We are going to do shows. This is going to be the French Foreign Legion of, of music. We are going to play everywhere. So if you don't have a passport, get one because we are going to travel. We are going to get to Japan. We're going to get to Australia. We're going to get to Eastern Europe where there's a gig. We are going. Are you guys sure you are cool with that and they said yeah i said no no no. i'm talking about touring like for nine months and like really going out and taking over planet earth like let's just go out there and just kill them and just like take over and they went yeah i said okay well let's that must do have been it. refreshing for you it's awesome it's awesome playing with people who just wanted to get up and go and do it who could write songs very quickly and we were very successful with that because we would just show up and play hey do you mind driving 10 hours and playing these shows no we did that last time we know long drives and gigs where there's no breathable air that's like every gig you do in italy there's like it's so many people there's no air you're like okay this gets gig will kill us let's go do it and that made us very successful because we played and played and played and just when we weren't playing we were writing and recording that's kind of what gets you places so when you guys left Texas Hotel, what label did you go to? Well, we had no label for a minute there, but we had a manager who begins to shop us. And that's when Kate Hyman at Chrysalis Records, who I already knew from doing that wartime 12-inch with Andrew. We had, we had a, a band for a minute. It was like a, a one three-song concept band. They did a 12-inch EP on Chrysalis. She left, Kate Hyman left Chrysalis with Terry Ellis, who owned half of Chrysalis, he formed Imago. And she said, I like Henry. I'm a and R. I want to hear Henry's new songs. We sent her what is now known as the End of Silence demos, those ones that we released recently. Right. And we sent her that cassette. And she went, whoa, I'll sign this right now. And it was a very small, as they say, it's, it was a little deal in that it was all skewed in favor of the record company. Always. Yeah, but this was like with, with extreme prejudice, where my lawyer is looking at it going, whoa, this is, this is like draconian. 
like this this contract says if you don't do a publishing deal with their publishing company there is no deal and i said i don't even know what music publishing really is she said it's a big it's going to be a big part of your life you know it's it's well, money the money is it, it's where your money is and the fact that they're making you do a publishing deal that's they shouldn't be able to tell you that i said so what am i doing she said uh you're going to do it cuz this is a good deal and um, this is the part where you just suck it up. And uh, you get a publishing advance. And it was the first time any of us had ever seen money. So but, you, you split the advance. Well, yeah, because we're all going to be, we all took equal credit oh, on the good. songs. Like sometimes it would be me and the bass player would just write a song. Right. Or in the case of a few songs, I wrote the thing. I don't want all of them. I'm money. with you. Bands should split it. Yeah. Because when you're in a room sweating it out and jamming and songs are coming out of it, everyone should get publishing, including the drummer. Thank you. Yeah. And but but you'll like this. And I don't know any band who who's ever done this. I'm not saying that anyone hasn't. We eventually put Teo in as well. The sound guy. Yeah. yeah. So we cut everything 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. But don't you think that keeps the peace? And yes. it makes everyone feel... And, and in my opinion, and it was all of our opinion, we, none, no one ever disagreed with this. Right. If you're in the room playing bass, you're as much... Without you, we don't have a song. I agree. And then we kind of went further, and we made Teo a member of the band. That's why Teo's in all the videos, because he's as much of the band as the drummer. Because without Teo, he's the version of the band you hear through the front of house. So he's as much a part of it as I am. And so we cut him in for publishing and it was kind of elementary. I mean, it was like, well, yeah. And everyone just thought, it was, I forget whose idea it was, like Andrew or Sims. And we all went, wow, absolutely. We told Teo and he was like, well, thanks. And we all got along, you know, fairly well for, for quite a while. And we just. Did you, in coming from the situation from Black Flag and it ended badly. Yeah. Was being in the Rollins band and having those guys, was it really fun in the beginning? Like, was it the first time you really enjoyed it or no? Yeah, it was enjoyable in that this is ours to realize. I came into Black Flag. There was already a reputation there. You know, it already wasn't my doing. But we all got in this band together and we wrote so many songs so quickly because our set was for quite a while. The core of it was all the songs Chris and I had written the year before for that Hot Animal Machine record. But I, I said, well, that's, just, that's, that's the old music. Let's let the four of us write what's going to be, you know. And so there comes the, the Lifetime record. And I said, let's just forget all that old material as fast as we can and just write our own signature and be us. And we all realized, like, wow, this is a new band. These are new songs written by us. The future is ours. It hasn't been written. It wasn't someone else's band that we got into. This is our thing that we are making every day we step up. And it's quite exciting to be young and looking at the world as this place that, you know, okay, I'm going out into it. And it kind of recharged me. Black Flag made me quite a bit cynical about things because sometimes the audiences would be kind of rough and this living situations would be kind of depressing. But with the Rollins band, you're like, okay, brave new world, bright future ahead. It's ours. And whatever it's going to be, at least it's ours. And just that on its own is super exciting. And so it was a great time. It was not without frustration. We didn't always get along. Uh, some people in the band had different ideas of activity level, how things should go and everyone was super opinionated in that band like everyone argued like there'd be long discussions and you end up being in a band who's you know someone you want to with someone you want to strangle anyway and that's like every isn't that kind of every band I'm about to say that's that's <laughs> everyone from me to the everly brothers and, and that's just how it is but it was a a very vigorous time and and we were very lucky we got some amazing things came our way, like Lollapalooza. And Perry Farrell changed the course of our band. We were Jane's Addiction's opening band for shows here and there, and we became friends, and they're great people and one of the more amazing bands I've ever seen. And at one point, Perry pulled me aside on his tour bus, and we were talking, and he told me about Lollapalooza. He's like, here's this thing I'm going to do next summer, man. And he asked me, you know, would you like to open the first half of the tour? 
And I just got really uh, kind of gutsy. And I said, um, no, I want the whole tour or nothing at all. And I think his initial thought was, let's give two little bands a shot. Like one band will do the first three weeks and another band. And that's cool. He's just being really cool. I wanted all of it. If I'm going to start the tour, I want to finish the tour. And so I said, Perry, I really need the whole thing or I can't do it at all. I can't, and I couldn't believe I was giving Perry Farrell an ultimatum. It's not that smart. And he said, let me think about it. And he came back that evening at, you know, at dinner time. There's a catered meal. And uh, he said, okay, that's it. And I still have this, the sheet. I should pull that out and show you sometime. Um, I still have the day sheet that's on the wall. This is uh, James Addiction would like to welcome Roll the Rollins band to Lollapalooza next year. And it's like, you're in. It's on the day sheet. And I, I tore down off the wall of our dressing room. And I, I, I still that's have really it. That's really cool. And that next summer... We go from playing in front of like 800 people in Minneapolis, which is a, a lot of people, to like 8,000 because of Lollapalooza. And then a few months later, End of Silence comes out and you've got a good record of, of people who all over America who've just seen you with a bunch of other cool bands and you're on your way. I mean, things are opening up for you the chili peppers were very very generous and said come be our opening band in europe for like six weeks playing in front of you know twenty thousand people a night and they have an amazing audience i mean people will fill up any space you have to see them and they were not as big as they are now but they were plenty big i mean we were playing big, big what year places. was this 91 blood sugar sex magic had just come out they fairly exploded they went from big to pretty mega and then at the end of the year the last five or six weeks of the year was us in opening for the Beastie Boys, which again was oh a God. huge fortune yeah. for us. It was um, one of the best bills ever as far as wanting to go see me seeing a gig. Cypress Hill would open and they were the best. Then we'd play and then the Beastie Boys would go on. So I would warm up watching Cypress Hill who were just incredible. Do my, my set. We had like 60 minutes or 45 minutes. And then you'd, shower up and go watch the beastie boys play because they're always great and I, so i got to see the beastie boys play in my life i don't know 40 sometimes and then at the end of that tour the bass player left and things changed and then, then we got melvin in the band and the band went for a complete overhaul in sound because those bass players are both really, really amazing, but completely different schools of approach, of thought, of discipline. They're both amazing, but just so different. And the music changed radically with Melvin. I don't know, better, worse, I have no idea, but just different. Were you guys on DreamWorks at this time? No, we did one, we had a two record for sure deal with Imago so that was the end of silence and wait and wait had the liar single which our first day of band practice we rented the practice space of Michael Jira of Swans mm -hmm. who's he was going to be and I think in Atlanta that summer writing songs with other people so he said hey rent my place which is perfect because it has a lock a bathroom a practice room you can't hear anything and so we took the key paid him and we're in this like airless room all summer making the writing the weight album our first day of band practice we had one riff which became civil the song civilized it was melvin melvin riff and as they're tuning up they're just like getting it together melvin is just just playing some kind of riff i start doing this vocal over it to crack up the guys and it, it was the l l lyrics for liar but i was just winging it I go, and you know why? Because I'm a liar. And everyone in the room laughed. And we have a, a cardboard sheet, like a, a beer box opened up as, a, as an idea, a blackboard. And someone said, well, put that thing up, liar. Okay, that, that could be a funny song. And we, we would just play it as a loose jam, and I would kind of do the joke. Ah, I'm a liar. That's why everything's going so well. And we played it one night at CBGB's. We was just like doing a show of like, you know, baby material. And the guy who ran Imago came and watched. He said, that's a single. That's going to be the first single on your new record. And we went, that's not going on the album. That's a joke song. 
We wouldn't even have an arrangement for it. And he, he said, oh, no, no, no. Trust me. I know this business. That's going on your record. And that's a single. And we're like, oh, no. No, no, no. That's, that's a funny song that we play for an encore. No, since no one's heard the song yet, the punchline kills them. And everyone at CB's is laughing. And that's, that's fun. And so we... Did you not want to record it? We just didn't take it seriously. For us, it was a, it was a joke. It's a funny, it's a, it has a punchline. And, but we played it like, okay, hey, here's a song. Like, how do we play yeah, this? I and, don't know. And the audience probably reacted. Oh, huge. They, they all laughed their asses off when right. I said, because I'm a liar. I was like, right. oh, you're funny. And so we, we made a, like a fake arrangement for it. Like, okay, that'll be a verse. That'll be a verse. And when are we going to do the big thing? Uh, when I nod at you, you come down on the one. And we just kind of made an arrangement for it, recorded it. And threw all the songs at the record company, Imago. And of course, the owner said, oh, no, there's your single. And we went into the desert uh, with that, that uh, photographer, uh, director guy, whose name is escaping me right now. The guy who did the oh. Joy Division film, Control. Uh, anyway, we went into the desert with him and shot that video. And the video comes out, the album comes out, and... Whose concept was the whole Superman, Henry Rollins as a superhero? Was that your concept? Yeah, I came up with the different outfits <laughs> um, and the idea of here's all these trustworthy images, a nun, a cop, Superman. And then the director, I basically storyboarded it. And then he said, and we're going to shoot it in the desert. And there's going to be this. And then I said, the desert, he said, trust me, it'll be really surreal. And I trust him. He's, he's amazing. He's so amazing, I can't even remember his name. Anyway, um, we did it per his instructions and my little baby idea of like me in different outfits. And uh, we all kind of, Anton Corbin, that's his name. Amazing, amazing guy. And so Anton had part of the idea. I had part of the idea with his great direction and lighting. We made the video. The album comes out and suddenly we're on Beavis and Butthead and... They had sound scan in those days. And like you'd be on Beavis and Butthead and you could see your record sales spike up. It's like the last of the liquid money. Was it weird for you after being in a band that, you know, wasn't mainstream at all to have that? Yeah. We're like, us? Wait, were you excited about it or was it? Oh, sure. But we were all so music centric. Like, let's just play well and write good songs. The success part is cool. Did you realize how successful it was becoming or were you guys just too busy to realize it? Oh, you know, I kind of noticed it because all of a sudden y your, your venue has sold out. Like your, that show you usually do in Rockford, Illinois, sold out two weeks in advance. Like, really? Oh, there's a whole lot of new people. And now there's more girls. More girls are walking up going like, hey, what are you doing later? You're like, oh, huh. You ever heard of the, you've heard the Iggy Pop song, Success. Of course. Here comes success. Here's my new car. It was like that because we're, we were never invited to play those big radio, you know, the Mighty Hawk in the Midwest brings you and all those bands play. We're never in that thing. Summer of 94, we were. Much to the, those audiences really didn't dig us. And we went out and did our thing and we play Liar and you'd see people go, oh, I know that song. Oh, so you're the band who does that. But the rest of the set, they weren't all that into. And so I realized this is the 15 minutes of Andy Warhol. Like this is a thing that's happening that's probably in conjunction with this single. So the single runs its course and the record company being a record Did company. Did you start resenting the single? I started to get really tired of people going like, I'm a liar, right? You're like, yeah, that's, that's me. Anyway, um, the next single comes out disconnect really cool video good song i thought and mtv and all the powers that be did with that video what they had done with all of our videos previously thunk into the trash can after two plays and our audience that extra 600 people a night kind of went down to an extra 300 people a night you know the people are still hanging on but the woo of the single the bubbles had come off that opened bottle of champagne. What year was that? 94. So is that the same year you won the Grammy for Get in the Van? No. 95. It, yes. The record, all of that came out in 94 and it got put into the Grammy nomination machine and spat out in 95. And so in 95, all of a sudden we're invited to play the Grammys because we've been, we're on the nominee list for 
best rock song along with Soundgarden and whoever else. And but also I'm, Get in the Van, and right? Also, all, yeah, the, the guys in the band are nominated for a Grammy. I'm nominated for two. Right. Spoken Word or the audio book. What did that feel like? Getting the Grammy? Well, just even being nominated. It was, for me, awards for art are odd. Like, your art's better than the other guy's art. I don't understand that conversation. The funnest part of it, before the event itself, was I was at the office where you first started working, and back in the days of the fax machine, oh, and the God. fax, the, <laughs> the fax comes out, <laughs> and it's Rob Halford, Judas Priest, mm-hmm. who's a really good guy. I met him in the summer of 94. His band Fight were playing in Tokyo the same time we were, and we, just, we were both at the Rapongi Prince Hotel. Super nice guy. And he faxed me. He goes, I just want you to know I'm voting for you. And you know, just, just want you to know that. I have that fax around that's here somewhere. That's so cool. So, super cool. So I said, all right, that's great. And then we get closer to the Grammys, and we're going to play. So we're down there doing the song over and over and over again. And like, wow, this is interesting. We've rented tuxes for the event. We're just going to be Weren't you funny. barefoot? With I was barefoot. And your pants were too short, right? In an Armani tux. Anyway. The, they have the televised Grammys, the ones that, you know, the big deal. Then they have the daytime Grammys for like the publisher, the writing, the camera guy, like the, the Grammys that really no one sees. That's where the audiobook Grammy is going to go down. And so it's like, you know, two in the afternoon. It's basically a smattering of people and some press. No one's that into it. I mean, the, the, the big wigs, the, the famous people, they're still at home. This is hours from the event. So it's mainly a press thing. And so I'm sitting there with David Bianco, who mixed weight, who is going to be mixing our live sound that night. And I'm sitting next to David. I'm in a pair of shorts, a sweat-stained T-shirt, because I've been... Dolphin shorts? No, I've just some utilitarian gym pants, because we've been playing that song over and over again. So I've got a performer's laminate on, sweaty T-shirt. So I've been there since like 9.30. And I ran from rehearsal... Just, I, I said, I got to take a break to see if I got a Grammy. I'll be right back. It was like that. It's funny. So I run over with like visible sweat stains and I'm sitting with Bianco. And I said, David, if I get the award, because we both knew I wasn't going to get it. I'm going to thank you. He's like, yeah, okay. And then, you know, all these awards go on and on. And then finally, and for the, you know, audio book or spoken word or whatever the assignment is, and the winner is, they, they announce all the contestants and my name comes up. I'm like, wow, that's cool. And the winner is, Henry Rollins, get in the van. And Bianco and I both look at each other and start laughing. Like, <laughs> and I didn't move. He went, go. I'm like, oh yeah, you're right. And I go running down the aisle. Did you have anything prepared to say? No. Because I, like, who's going to, like, when am I going to win a Grammy? So I run down there. Two security guys get up and block my way. <laughs> they go like, yo, get him. And no one knows who I am. And they're all looking. Like, is, is it him? Is it him? I, I don't know. And I'm like, no, no. Tr- believe me, it's me. And I show my Grammy performer laminate. And I go, look, I've been here all day. And they kind of, with great hesitation, let me go on stage. And they're all like, should we give him the Grammy? I mean, no one knew who I was. And I, they give you a blank Grammy. Because yours comes in the mail like six weeks later. And so they give you this Grammy and they go, well, go do your little thing. And I said immediately, uh, it, it must be weird for people like you to look at a person like me holding something like this. And I don't know how <laughs> I was able <laughs> That's to so cool. have that come out of me so smoothly. Perfect. It was pretty perfect. And I hold that up and there, these people are not even clapping. They're like, uh-huh, who is this guy? And then I look at David Bianco, who's like sitting way in the back. And I said, David, or like David Bianco, I love you, man. Like really loud. (laughs) And he actually dove like out of sight, like he's trying to dodge a snowball being thrown at his head. And I I am then whisked away because you have to go do this press thing and, and this line and this line. And in every room, they give you a different Grammy, all blank. And you do the photo, give it back, go talk to MTV. And I stood in line behind Kirk Douglas. He was being interviewed by downtown Julie Brown for some reason. And I stood behind him and looked at him. He's such an amazing 
face. I'm like, damn, man, Kirk Douglas. And I have to stay at the venue all day. So I got the Grammy, shook the hands, and then I have to wait to play. Okay, but let me ask you. Yeah. I know you don't care about awards. I get it. No, no. It, but it were you cool. happy to have... I mean, to be acknowledged? Well, since you're being voted on by your peers, well, that's what I'm, fellow musicians and people in saying. the industry. I said, yes, it was, it was really cool. It would have been great to have won for the band so they could have one, but Soundgarden won. And like, they're great. And they're, they're cool people. And we were both waiting in the wings. Both bands wait together because it's either going to be you or the other guys. And you both wait. And it's, and it's Soundgarden. We all looked at them and said, hey, man, great. And Chris Cornell, I think he... He held up the Grammy and said, this, this belongs to the Rollins band, really. But, you know, tonight it was us. But, you know, hey, they're great. And, and you know, he's a real gentleman. Didn't you guys open the show with Liar? Yes, we played. And uh, you said there were a few uh, famous musicians in the front uh, giving Lennox, you stink eye? Annie Lennox <laughs> gave us the most horrific <laughs> stink eye. And I'm, she's a musician I totally admire. She's amazing. But she wasn't into us. And Peter Gabriel was just like looking at us like, get off the but you're stage. assuming that you uh, ass- you're assuming that we looked we saw it looks like they were <laughs> smelling eggs and anyway, you kind of like that you do it was hilarious because i did uh, the version that night i did it as much i tried to channel bill murray okay hey you know we got a song it's called liar i want to do it oh you're you doing right. the lounge yeah uh-huh. and it's like just totally repulsive <laughs> and i was like yo hey <laughs> and in the daytime, all the celebrities, you know, they, the camera needs to know where to whip. If say you're going to be nominated for a Grammy, the camera man needs to know where to find you. He can't be looking for you live. He needs to go, and there he is. So all the names of the nominees are all, this, their names are on seats, and the cameramen are all day. Whip to this person, whip to that person, just so when they have to, they don't screw up because it's live TV. You can't do it twice, and you can't go, where is he? So I memorize where all these different people are going to be sitting. Al Green is going to be right there. I'm definitely going to go like, hey, big guy. <laughs> like, hey. And this guy's going to be sitting there. And I, I had all my eye points. So I sang part of it to Al Green because he's great. And it was just a really funny, ex- fun experience. Springsteen played that night. And we get, you know, get to see him perform uh, Streets of Philadelphia. It was just really amazing. As soon as we were done, we get off stage. The tux rental people came immediately into the dressing room. Get the clothes off. Give us our clothes back. They, they couldn't wait to get us out of those clothes. Why? Because we were sweating in them. <laughs> you know, the drummer's back there in an Armani tux beating up <laughs> the drums. Anyway, um, then you get redressed and you go to the after parties. Did and you we, go? Yeah. We had the car. The Grammys gives you a car all night. And we went to A&M. And that's where I met uh, Gene Simmons. And someone said, hey, Henry, uh, you're standing next to Gene Simmons. Let's do a photo. I looked over and there's Gene Simmons. I didn't really recognize him. And uh, we were introduced. And he goes, hey, Henry, good to meet you. And the camera guy starts taking photos. And Gene Simmons bear hugs me and starts dry humping the side of my leg. (laughs) You Uh, loved it. I've met him. I've known him like 10 seconds. And he's like, ugh, ugh, ugh. And I'm like, okay, there's a photo. And I remember doing that with Maynard from Tool, just kind of staring at the both of us like, wow, <laughs> that's really weird. And that happened. And so it was, a, it was an interesting night. And I ended up getting a, you know, in, a month or so later in the mail comes your Grammy. And it's in t- my office now. And it's in your office now. But it was it was cool to be acknowledged by your peers. And it should, you know, and, and the, there's a thing that really bugged me, and it bugged a lot of people, I think, the other day when Beck got his award right. for his Morning Phases record, which is a really beautiful record. And I've listened to it twice. And I don't, I don't know Kanye West, and I, re- I, I honestly don't know his music. But I don't understand why you got to rain on anyone's you don't. parade. You don't that have was to. Really you un- don't have really to. Really uncool. And and I don't know Beck obviously, but he seems like a shy guy. He seems shy to me. So let the guy have his moment. Yeah. Why can't you leave him alone? And I I didn't I don't watch the Grammys, but no. when I heard about that and I watched a little of it online, I'm like, damn man, like what what's your problem? 
And it, it made me go listen to that record again. I'd listened to it to once. To Beth's record. Yeah, and yeah. I listened to it again. The whole thing, I sat and listened to it. He's talented. Um, it, it's a really beautiful sounding record. It's very musical. And when you listen to it, you can understand why a bunch of people who are on the, vote, the voting committee of the Grammys would appreciate it. Because it's got, it's got a lot of music in it. You know what I mean? It's, it's a musician's record. Like You hear it and you're like, wow, that's a lot of work going on there. And the idea of uh, you're getting, you get voted in by your peers, which is really cool. And uh, to, to be interrupted. Yeah. And so for me on, on my little night, and for you know, my grand is 20 years ago. So it's in my rear view. Yeah. But if, if I would have in 20 years ago, if someone would have done that to you, you would have clocked them. It would have been a totally different <laughs> outcome. Yeah. But, and I'm not saying that would be the right way to handle the situation. But it but would have been your instinct. It, it would have been definitely my instinct. But it was cool to, to know that there's people like Rob Halford who were voting for you. And it, it made the whole experience really fun. And it, I think it had a, a, an interesting effect on the band where I knew it was part of the war holy in 15 minutes and you should just shut up and get back to work and make your next record. Some members of the band thought, well, this is just kind of how we're living from now on. No one got a big ego. But they kind of had this idea oh, like bad it's, move. it's just strength to strength and every door is going to open. Bad move. And to this one person who's like really good guy, I said, you better smell some coffee and yeah. wake up because the Grammys is nothing but an industry thing. It comes and it goes. You are now, you now have an empty basket you need to put songs in. So let's get to work and write another record. Yep. And he, and uh, this one, this person said to me, Next record's going to be huge. I went, really? Oh, of all no. people to say that? You're way too smart to say that and way too cynical. And the next record was called Coming and Burn, and that was on DreamWorks. And that was a really tough time for me because we left Imago after Imago went out of business. And Imago sued me for leaving. Which is so insane. They sued you for leaving even though they went out of business. Well, they, they still had the contract. Yes, but... They were no longer a functioning label. Right. But they still said, we own you for right. for the option. Such crap. And I'm like, really? Because the owner of that label, I've been to his house in New York. I said, you have Picassos. <laughs> like, you are really rich. Let me go. You don't need me. And the paltry sum you're going to get to lob me to some label. And he just wouldn't do it. He comes from an older school. Like, I have you under contract. You are mine. And that was a very expensive and painful legal process. So I'm living in New York, wake up at some ridiculous hour in the morning, put on my fake suit, put on a tie, which the lawyer had to loan me, take a train uptown. For mediation? Yeah. Go sit in a room and get deposed by a lawyer who's like trying to get me to yell. Were you guys trying to mediate? Yeah, but okay. we both have to get deposed. Right. So I get deposed and get harangued by a lawyer who's trying to get me to blow up. It's being filmed. And so he's so, you said this in an interview, you said Imago's cool. How do you define cool? And what you really want to do is go across the table and like, you know, help this guy out, you know, with, with some traction. <laughs> but you have to sit there and take it and not lose your cool. I was trained to take a deposition and the best lesson I got was you go in with 100 points. All you can do is lose. You're not going to come out with 101. The best you can do is come out and not get burned up too much. So concise answers. He will try and bait you. Don't fall for it. Immediately, he started trying to bait me. I was like, oh, okay. And I was just zen. But then I'd have to take the end of the R train back down East Village, change out of my corny clothes, go to band practice. And it was just like that all the time. So that's when it was getting real dark. I, those tour, the, when, I, wait, did you guys ever open up for Iggy? Yeah. And it was so much fun because he's just so great. We opened for, for Iggy once in 90. I wouldn't want to go on after Iggy. I'll tell you no, that. No, there's, there's no doing it. Yeah, exactly. You don't even try. Exactly. Um, I, we opened in summer 94 in Denmark. And they did a really interesting set that night. They did I'm Sick of You, Great Stooges yep. song. And I don't know if I've ever seen him do that live again. And at one point, everyone's cheering. He's, hey, it's great being back in Copenhagen. I know where I am, man. And everyone's like, woo! <laughs> and, and he's a, you know, he's a real prince of a guy. And we opened. It was big fun. And then we opened for him again in Finland at a festival uh, where it was us, then Iggy, then The Cure. 
And that was the first time we had ever been to Finland. It was really, really, really cool. And then we played with him again in 97 at a big radio thing where we, it was us, uh, Reverend Horton Heat, amazing guy, great band. He's such a good dude. It was us, the Reverend, and Iggy. And then, but oh, in 92, it was really fun. We were on tour with the Beastie Boys. Iggy's in New Orleans doing, um, I'm forgetting the name of the record. He's recording uh, at um, that studio, at Daniel Lenoir's studio. Uh, American Caesar, the American Caesar record. Iggy finds out that me and the Beastie Boys are down the road. He calls the venue. Hey, have Henry come down and do some vocals. I'm like, well. Oh, my God. On my way. That's like the heavens opening up. Yeah, we I ran down there and did that song, Wild America. They videotaped all of it, which is you can see in the video of us, in the video press kit of us singing Wild America together. And then, because um, at CB's, CBGB's one time, Iggy and I were sitting there we had played he came to sh- it's so great he's at our gig and uh he said hey man that was great he goes uh, he, man we should jam together on stage sometime man you should you know come on stage and jam with me sometime and i said you and you can come and jam with us and he said okay and like well maybe one day that happens and so in 92 i went down you know to record it i said hey iggy you want to come to sound check and let's just, like write something and do it tonight and he went really i went yeah man are you kidding he went okay so i come back from making the the song and i go are you guys ready iggy's down here like in 10 minutes and we're gonna write a song and play with him tonight and the man's like let's do it like no fear like let's go iggy comes in everyone is at attention beastie boys everyone's saying like and like did you know iggy pop is here and i'm like yeah because he's uh it is weird though when he is in the room the earth spins a little different it's, it, a, it's and i'm not joking no, he, cha- he changes things but the beastie boy was like did icky pop is here i said yes i know he's jamming with us on stage tonight you know eat your heart out and so iggy comes on stage and we said what do you want to do he said let's do like a, a you know like a one four five bluesy thing and we write this thing like boom let's just write it and we wrote it and we I said okay hold that idea be back here at 8 30 or something like that and around that time i looked off to stage left iggy is shirtless holding a microphone with the piercing eyes that burn holes it's like through a racehorse waiting for the gates to open he completely fell. <laughs> yeah no he's like he's like an animal on the on the serengeti plains yeah. and i'm like oh no and i go ladies and gentlemen our special guest and i'm as i'm saying iggy pop he just comes running out right past me and kind of runs into Money Mark's keyboard, the Beastie Boys keyboard player, and it's like, knocks that over. I spent most of the song on the drum riser getting out of his way. And there's two- As you do. As you do. And the, in fact, the whole band put their backs against the back line because you got to give the man room or you might get hurt. And so- we, I mean, he, talk about using the whole stage. Yeah. No, no, he uses the walls, the ceiling. Yeah, he uses everything. The whole thing. and. Uh, I'll never forget some guy looked up at me from the audience and said, he's kicking your ass. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, thank you. And so we you know, came to the end and everyone clap, clap, clap. And Beastie Boys went out there and did their thing. They were amazing. And so, yeah, I've had a, a few. And then in April of 2011, was it? You and me went well, out we'll to Well, we'll talk about that another time. Because That's a good story. We should tell we'll, it we'll, Yeah, we will. No, we'll get on that next time. But... I want to go back because I took us out of the lawsuit. Oh, okay. So you're going from the the lawyers to band practice. Yeah, it was miserable. And it's heavy, and Awful. you guys aren't really getting along at this point. The song, the, the band's not able to write songs. It's just not working. Meanwhile, we're in a very expect, expensive practice room, which hemorrhages money every day. We're all showing up at like 10 a.m., 10 to 4. We're writing songs, and it's just not happening. And meanwhile, I'm getting sued, and it was just a bad time. I met you right after all this. Yeah, it was awful. Yeah, I met you. You know, I'm in legal, I'm having legal problems. I'm paying everything I have to a lawyer. The band isn't cooking. Like, the songs are not happening. So when did you know, the Rollins band, that it was done? Like, in your gut, when did you know? And how long after that did you continue? Oh, about two years. And so, well... 
the songs but are that's coming. like a long funeral we, yes it was, it was a like look how long it takes that animal to die <laughs> exactly. like oh my god how many arrows does it have in its side a spear oh my god <laughs> anyway <laughs> you, you didn't know an animal could bleed so much and so we would go into band practice four days four weeks for months and a song here a song there but nothing like the time before it's like there's a song there's a song there's a song and so we ended up I would go in on Saturdays. We would write tunes during the week. I'd write lyrics. On Saturdays, Teo and I would go to the practice room because we had a little like 16-track Mackie board thing set up. And I would do my vocals on the instrumental track. And Teo would just sit there and go, no. I go, what do you mean no? He's like, it's not good enough. I'm like, really? And I trust him. If he says it's not good enough, I'm going back to the drawing board. So all of these songs that you hear on on the coming and burn record often those songs have another five complete sets of lyrics fully finished they said nope start again and i would just spend the whole weekend like okay and it breaks your ego to pieces and it was like i've always been tempted to release the journals and the lyrics and the notes from that time because it's like well over a hundred songs i wrote it's like nuts and the whole thing kind of made me hyper depressed. And I'm living in the East Village. And on the weekends, we knock out. We go Monday through Friday and the weekends, we all just kind of get away from each other. And I would just walk from like 13th and 2nd to Carnegie Hall and back. Just like, you know, whatever that is. And it's 60 blocks each way. Just like grinding my teeth. And one time, I'll never forget this. I was like on 2nd and about 20th. And a woman came out of a bar, didn't know me. She said, you have such an awful expression on, she grabbed me by my arm. She said, you have such an awful expression on your face. Are you okay? And it, I, I was like, huh? Uh, no, I'm okay. And I just kept walking. I said, man, I must look awful. And it was just a really Well, when you're depressed, you do, when you're depressed, you do look like a murderer. No Thanks. joke. But I was getting, you know, I'm getting, I know. I'm getting billed. I'm getting, I'm, I have I to know. see. I know. The you bills? are getting the crap beat out of you. You should have seen a check I had to sign for $16,000 for Xeroxing. And I saw that. I went, this is far too big and bloated. We're dead. I'm, I'm a dead man. And I'm hating life. And it's really awful to have to be fully functioning and be hating your life as much as we were hating our lives at that point. So when when was the final goodbye in the Rollins band? We did the 97 tour, which actually did pretty well. And then... Boy, this is really, really right when I met you. Yeah, this is 90... We started writing in 95. 95, 96, we write. 96, 97, we record. 97, we tour. And so it's like this three-year odyssey of like, okay. And so we finish some dates in South America. And then there's like an odd four weeks off and then there's going to be like four shows or three shows in Japan and it's so spinal tap and the band doesn't see each other for the whole time I'm back in LA and the band is going to fly to Japan like two days before me meet and rehearse I'm going to come in for like the third day of practice I mean we're not even getting together to rehearse we're just going to do it you know I got your band practice right here and we're just going to go do this where it's like kind of corny like because that's not how we were like we would it is when you're getting a divorce, and I speak from experience. Yeah, but this was not like we were, and like, wow, we are right. not being who we should be. Because we, you knew. Because we all knew there's a fork in us, and we're being turned over, exactly. and we're done. So we get out there, and everyone's ragged from jet lag. We practice at like 2 in the morning. It was just surreal. And we do two shows in Tokyo, one in Osaka, Osaka, and maybe one other one, Fukuoka, I forget where. But I think maybe Osaka was the last show. We do the show. Eh, you know, it was okay. Some people showed up. I don't know. I still have the set list with green a green tea stain on it. And we went out to dinner. And one member of the band still has stars in his eyes. He says, Aww. so we're going to get together in April and, and start practicing, right? And he really doesn't want this to end. And Sim, our wonderful drummer, looks up from his sushi and he goes, don't you understand? 
we have broken up. And he went, oh. So he was. He finally said what you were all thinking. Yeah. And no one had said it out loud. Right. But we all knew. And we sat there eating this dinner, almost crying. It was just awful. And the next day, some guys are flying to London. Some guys flying to Holland. One guy's going to LA. One guy's going to New York. Everyone's just kind of scattershotting at the airport. And I didn't fly home with anybody. I was like solo back to LA. And we all were at the airport like, well, yeah. And no one even said goodbye. It was like, we we're just so, it was over. It was so painful. And I came back to LA just feeling awful about everything, breathing, eating, <laughs> existing. It was so depressing and so completely shattering. And that was basically around Thanksgiving-ish 1997. I came back without really any will to live. I was just like so, my ego had just completely been destroyed. I just thought I was worthless. And I'm not one who thinks he's anything anyway. So it doesn't take much for me to feel like, you know, something you stepped on. And so, uh, or stepped in. And so it was a really tough time. That's about when I met you. Right then, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. You met me at a, a very bad the time. The darkest time of your life. Darkness. Darkness. Well, uh, and that was it. That was it. Well, then, and then the other guys came in, but that was it for that lineup. Uh-huh, until someone in the band gets a bright idea in 2006. Hey, I know. Let's get the band back together. That was you. That was Chris Haskett. Who's... But that was for the Rise Above tour. No, no, that was 2003. No, 2006 was Chris saying, hey. I don't remember this. Let's get back together and do the band. I said, okay, you guys go to New York together and practice and tell me if it's any good. Because those three were living in New York at the same time. And Chris called me and said, we've been practicing for two days. It sounds great and everyone's into it. I said, okay, I'll come out and inspect. So I flew out there, went to band practice. We haven't played Sick. together for like nine years. And it sounded good. And we, you know, I love these guys. So all the old jokes come I know come you back. do. I know you do. Yeah. And I said, do you guys want to tour again? And they're like, uh-huh. I said, fellas, let's all just take a day and think about it. Because I'm not into messing I remember, around. Okay, I do remember this. And I remember being surprised that you would even fly out there. Well, I owed it to them. They're going to sure. put in the time to practice. I'm going to put in the time to come out and check it out. And so we toured with X. We we're X's opening band on the X Rollins band tour of summer 26, 2006. And it was funny. Oh yeah. Remember I said you have to do liar cause you weren't going to. And I was like, you have to. And we did. And it was so weird. Anyway, <laughs> we tour and it was like a six week tour. And at one point in the tour, did I know that I shouldn't have done this? By the second show. I'm like, wow. <laughs> so don't get this the wrong way. We weren't sitting there phoning it in. We played. Yeah, but you're not that guy anyway. No, but we should not have done it. It was not because we didn't write any new songs. And check this out. The last show is in LA. At I forget where, like the key club or something. It's just like, you know, there you go. There's your show. And some girl was some friend of somebody said, Hey, let's do a photo with her cell phone. And she took a photo of all of us all standing together. That is the only shot of that, a group shot from that tour. Wow. Who says we are just not even, you know, there. And they all knew it too. I, I guess. But I, I remember that last show without a word. I had a, a plastic mail crate from the USPS from the book company. I put my shorts and my sweaty clothes in it. My, you know, it was a gearbox. I slunk out of the dressing room. There was like four kids in the parking lot, shook their hands, signed their things, got in my car, drove home, showered, did the laundry. I wanted this whole thing off me and off my clothes. And one of them called the next day. Hey, man, I'm flying back to New York. Have a nice flight. Click. And I just, I don't hate him. I just like, we're done. Get home safe. And let's not talk with each other for like a really long time. <laughs> but I think you kind of needed it because then you really knew. Yeah. There was no revisiting it. But um, it was a bad idea. And I wrote it about it in a book. I, I did a whole book about it, A Dull Roar, which yep. started that awful uh, uh, streak of journal books we've been doing for the last few They're years. They're not awful. 
alone backstage. Twenty two hundred. Oh. <laughs> oh. Or uh, you always have you always have to put. Oh, for twenty hours, I am alone. No one knows me. In this hotel room, I am invisible. <laughs> They're not is, horrible. People love those books. This is unwitnessed time. I am alone. Uh, well, that's four, the story of the Rollins band. And by the way, hours. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, the lawsuit didn't go well in your favor, and you lost a lot of money. And oh. it was really unfair. But you know what? The record companies. Unfortunately, the artists have suffered too, but the record companies got what they had coming to them because all they've done is screw artists, period. And here's something that's funny. Um, recently, a guy wrote me and he said, is this real? And I go, you know, now I have to go to some website. And I said, okay, let's see if it's real, whatever this is. And what what is it? It is the, the, re, the, like the 20th anniversary of the Wait album on vinyl. And I'm thinking, you don't have the master tapes to that. You do, right? Yeah. And so, and, and why did I get them? Because a mastering place, I think it was Sterling, was purging all these tapes that people have left. And they, they emailed us and said, there's some tapes of yours that are here. Here's an option. We can FedEx them to you or we can throw them out. I said, I'll take the FedEx option. And they I remember that. They were so nice about it. Yeah. I, said, I said, we'll give they you our FedEx number. They said, no, 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 we got this. Don't worry about it. And they're super nice. And so that record, which they didn't, no one at that record label asked me to do this. They just did it. And so what they mastered off of is probably a CD. So uh, as they say, caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. Buyer beware. Buyer beware, 2,200 hours. So... um. That's the story of the Rollins band. That's right. And unfortunately... We have to go. We have to go very soon. We have a meeting. But do you want to do Heidi's headlines? Uh-huh. And I'm just, this one's a really long one, so read it. I, Henry... Well, I have to wait for the computer to turn back on for the sound effects. Jackhammer, please. That's queued up. I'm, I'm going to be bringing in more sound effects. So I hope that this was kind of long. I hope it wasn't too long. I hope this podcast is helping you get down the highway, alleviate some boredom. And we will do these, and uh, we are what we're trying to do. And it's going to take us about a week to get this on schedule. But by the time you hear this, we probably will be on schedule. We are trying, we're going to try to make Friday the day that we we put these out. I think it's going to take us a week to fall into that. And it will be on iTunes, and you will be able to subscribe. Yeah, and this is all of this stuff. We are now learning it as we go. We're gorilla. Yes, you're a gorilla. You're a gorilla. I'm a. One good-looking gorilla. Okay. Nah, I know. I keep telling yourself that, Rollins. Rawlings. Okay, hold on a second. Here we go. Pot the... Uh, we are so not smooth. Okay. This, this <laughs> I sound. like it. Okay. <laughs> and that sound of Henry's psyche being smashed to a powder means it's time for one thing and one thing only. Heidi's headlines. Wow, this is a really... It's really long. Heidi types really fast. What? Henry what types... What does it say? I'm trying to read. Henry types really fast, and you think he's doing a lot of work on his new book by the sound of the clacking on his keyboard. But when Heidi goes to see what he's written, it's only one sentence because all that clacking is really him hitting the delete button on all his typing mistakes. Shall we <laughs> shall we listen? Here's how it's I write so true. Here's how I write the word the. the. And and Henry, that's no joke. I Door I I think <laughs> was opened. It's true. And I figured it out about, I don't know, 10 years ago. I was like, wow, he is really moving over there. I went over there. There was one sentence. Because really what you do is you're spending most of your time hitting the delete button for all the mistakes you've made. Heidi, can you describe to the listeners what is off of your right elbow in a stack? All your handwritten books. That's why every first draft I do is handwritten because I can write even quickly. Even with emails. Even with email, I'll come over, it'll be a two-answer email, and it's like... Yeah, yeah. Which basically translates into... Thanks, Henry. Thanks, Henry, yeah. Um, <laughs> Heidi, who taught you how to type? 
I learned properly in school, Henry. Okay, who taught me how to type? I don't know. Me. So <laughs> it's no good. My t- my technique is. It's I just, just so weird. It's just weird. I've never heard anything like it. And your keyboard it annoys me. It's like a hamster on a wheel. Okay. And. Thanks, uh-huh. Henry. No problem. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Am I lying? You no, know, you're, you know, you're like the beacon of truth, Ivy. Everything you say is right. Don't act exhausted. Uh, he, Henry exhaust always me. acts like I exhaust him. Well, we have, with all that tapping, I think we did just delete the applause. No, sound you did that. There we go. Oh, there, no, oh, no, oh, no. Hold oh, on. no. Quit deleting things. See, folks, this is how it goes. Watch out for Henry on a keyboard. Okay, so... Are, are we going to bring this thing to a close well, now? We have to. We have to go to a meeting. Okay. And so thank you so much for listening. We will be back with you very soon. Uh, this is Henry. This is Heidi. Until next time. Woo! Yeah! <laughs> That's a great sound you made. We're not here now.